Okay. Um, first of all, it's quite amazing. I don't think I've been to a meetup where there were this many people and these great facilities. It's almost like a real conference. So excellent. Um, let's get started. Uh, my name is Tim. Um, I am Dutch. I'm living in Berlin. Um, 38 years old, and I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about job queues, deployment, and sandboxing. And if I had known that I was allowed to change the title, I would have, because I created another title that says actually what we're trying to do with all these queues and sandboxing is coming up later. And the core of what I'm trying to do and what we're going to talk about is running untrusted JavaScript in a kind of SaaS environment. So, a um, tiny bit about me and my background. Um, I started out working in IT in end of the 90s, just before the dot-com crash, mostly working on IBM WebSphere stuff at banks. Um, that's about as much fun as it sounds. And I did operations for many years. Um, that's basically my background. This was before we started calling operations DevOps. Um, switched to more e-commerce related stuff, um, also still a lot of Java, J2EE, AIX servers, all that crap, and even a little bit of Windows, and it's pretty scary. Um, at a certain moment, when the cloud started happening, um, I switched to more focused role in uh, um, cloud and DevOps uh, and technical management of all those things. And I founded my first startup called Vamp.io, which I'm not going to talk about at all today. It's still running, it's in Amsterdam, it's perfectly fine with uh, one of my best friends that started that. It's very cloud-related container deployment stuff. Uh, great for another talk, but not here. Um, two years ago, I, uh, or three years ago, I moved to Berlin and I started working at Ulu. Maybe you guys know it. It's a Berlin startup, they make electric scooters. Um, and uh, I was head of IT there. And we started doing a lot of Node.js, very serious uh, Node.js stuff, all, all kinds of things, uh, from IoT stuff to e-commerce stuff uh, across the board. Um, but having been a uh, startup founder before, I kind of started itching and I wanted to do my own thing again. Um, and that's where we are now. Um, I'm a pretty young Node.js or JavaScript developer, so all the code samples that you're going to see probably going to be horrible. Um, please be gentle. Okay. Let's start with the problem, what I want to describe to you. And this is going to sound like a sales pitch. It actually is, but bear with me. Um, it actually makes sense for the rest of the story. So six months ago, I started building Checkly. Um, Checkly is a software as a service um, that does active monitoring. And what it does is two things. It uh, actively validates the correctness of your API endpoints and also the response time. And it actively validates your browser click flows or browser transactions. It's only two things it does. Um, and if we're if I'm pretty honest and we're at the Node.js meetup, there are, you could call Checkly a very, very elaborate wrapper around the request library and the fairly new Puppeteer library by Google, uh, by Google Chrome's, uh, sorry, Google's Chrome team. Um, I'm just going to show you what it does very, very shortly, because then it will make sense. Check out. Um, is this visible? Yes, it is. Great. Oh, I actually already have it open. <laughs> So this is the landing page, but the most interesting thing is here. What I've made available on the landing page is the experience you will have if you log in to Checkly. Uh, and it's basically a little script um, that does, in this case, a browser click flow on the Etsy site. And I can just press run. What it does, it's queuing your script, it's running the script somewhere in the background, and it validates if the things that it clicks on are correct. This is done in the background by the Puppeteer library, which is for you guys that are familiar with things like Casper JS or um, what's it, Phantom JS, uh, Selenium. It kind of does the same thing. 
So that's one bit. That's the first thing the browser click flow, and then it also does API checks. It's a bit more simple. Uh, you give it a URL, you give it some, you know, some post information, some headers, and you can create assertions and it says, hey, is the st status code 200? Yes, it is. Is there some kind of key in the JSON response that is a certain value? Yes, it is. Uh, with this response time, in this case, less than 500 millis milliseconds, etc., etc. If this changes, alarm bells go, go off and you get a notification. This is what Checker does in a nutshell. So that looks pretty easy, right? Um, you click a button, it runs, boom, you're done. And to be completely honest, the API part is actually fairly straightforward. Um, there's some details around running this in multiple locations. Let's say you want to run it from the US and from Japan, a couple of things with messaging, but the implementation is fairly straightforward. Um, if you want to know more about that, come up to me after the talk. Um, but it's not the most interesting thing. The interesting thing is the browser uh, checks with Puppeteer library. And um, why is that? It is interesting because it runs untrusted code. If you saw the little code editor on the homepage, you can basically put whatever you want in there. And running untrusted code on your own servers is a pretty interesting problem, and I don't recommend it to anyone. It really had me uh, scratching my head, and it really gave me much respect for other companies that do this, uh, let's say any CI, CD tool, like I don't know, Travis or what, what have you, uh, running this stuff and allowing the user so much control over what happens in your back end, it's uh, pretty daunting. So what we're gonna talk about is how I fix this and, or fixed how I'm running this. I'm not saying this is the end or best solution ever, but it will, um, give you some insights and, and, and tell you a bit like how you can chop this problem up into bits. So, um, I actually want to start at the end. Uh, no, wait, wait, let's, let's first look at what actually can happen if you're running untrusted code. If you would take the most simple, simple solution possible, what can users do? Oh, this is readable. Um, some JavaScript. They can put in a wild, true, endless loop. This means the process never ends. And you basically walk up your whole CPU of whatever box you're running on. Super funny. Um, try this with other services on the internet. Lots of people don't check for this. And they will thank you for that. Um, they can start reading your passwords file. Uh, in this case, it's a read file uh, from Etsy pass WD. Uh, not a nice idea. No, you don't actually get the passwords, but you do get tons of information about users from that, if you're not running on Windows, of course. Um, they can read your super secret Rockstar code, because there's probably an index.js somewhere in your root from where this code is running, and there goes your startup, and someone else copies it, and they get all the billions, and you don't. Then, at line 11, they can just start killing stuff. You require your child process library, you do a little uh, process listing, and just start kill me nine, whatever is there. Super fun time. Um, they could just quit um, at line 16, just exit the whole thing. Um, or just exit, if you're really bad at security, they could shut down the whole machine. That's pretty fun. Um, so it's not really the question of what could go wrong, it's what couldn't go wrong. And, how the hell do I keep people from doing this? So I want to start at the end. This is the solution. This is what I came up with. And I'm going to talk you through it. Here with the dancing hamster, that's where the actual puppeteer code is. Or that's where money is being made. Um, and what I want to do is I want to give you a short overview of this. And I'm going to go all the way back to the beginning and flesh this out and see how I came to this. Let me get my notes. Yes. So um, let's start at one. Uh, the client you saw, this was on the home page of the, or the landing page of Checkly. That is a client. It's a small Vue.js app that's just embedded in the landing page. 
What it does when you press run browser check, it sends an API request to the API, which is a happy JS um, library. Um, the untrusted code is wrapped as a string, basically. Very, very simple. Um, the API puts it into queue, in this case, an Amazon queue. More about that later. Then there is a bunch of launcher processes. And what they do is they listen to the queue, pick up the messages, and start executing this code. And they do this by launching Docker containers. And in the Docker container, there's a different Node.js process called the runner. And the runner starts up something called VM2. And in VM2, there's the dancing hamster that runs the code. Um, pretty elaborate, uh, lots of stuff. And on the deployment node, all of this stuff is running even on different providers. Um, that stuff is on Heroku, the queues are on Amazon, and this actual thing that's running your puppeteer checks is running on whatever is cheapest at the moment. It's running on Vulture, it's a provider right now. I don't really care as long as it is in the right regions. Um, I can dump the code on there and run it, it doesn't really matter. So, Let's, like, let's take a look at each step in a bit more detail. And what would happen if I would have implemented this like in the most easy way possible, the most simple way possible? You would have this. And this is not going to be good, but it's going to be fun. So what happens? We have a Vue.js app, there's code, pushes it into the API. The API reads the untrusted code and says, yes, let's start running this stuff. Um, I'm pretty sure you guys would know why this is a bad idea. Um, we saw the pieces of code earlier. People could just crash the whole API super easily. Uh, do the while true loop, your API does not respond anymore to anything. So everything stops right there. Um, not very, very, very good way of doing this. Um, even more um, with the read file um, stuff, you can actually read all the API, um, a the API keys that are exposed as environment variables. It's very easy to do. If you look at other services that are doing a similar thing, thing just do a process.env and then a console log, you will find a lot of very interesting stuff. Um, so this is a bad solution. We should never do this uh, and always push long running jobs into the background. Um, and this is what I came up with. It's fairly standard. Lots of other people are doing it this way. And um, what we see here is the following. You see the client again, you see the API again, happy JS. There's also a cron job, which I haven't talked about. Um, when I just demoed it, we ran the puppeteer script in an interactive environment. You saw the output coming in as it was running. Um, once you're happy with that script, that's, yes, I want to do this check on my shopping cart or uh, what have you, you save the thing and then it's actually executed by a Chrome job. These are both clients to this queue um, using exactly the same mechanism. It's just that with the Chrome job, we don't need any interactive output. We just want to resolve to be stored in the database, and then we can do some analytics on it later on. So, um, what you can see here, it's more interesting also, is that with these little flags here, is that we're running a queue for all these checks on each region that is available. This is a fairly common feature to have in this uh, monitoring tools because you want to check the availability of your API or your uh, browser flows from different locations around the world. Working with stuff like Amazon makes that trivially easy. Um, I'm very, very, very happy that they have that feature. An extra little note that I put on top there is that the, the messages with the untrusted code in them are not actually put into the SQS queue server uh, directly. They're actually shot in there through a pop sub mechanism called SNS. And for those of you who are not familiar with how AWS works and all their services, short note, um, SNS is called Simple Notification Service, if I'm correct, and it's basically a pops up um, broker, um, kind of similar to some parts of RabbitMQ, if you're familiar with that. It's very easy to set up. But what this gives me is 
that I can have other listeners to this topic, uh, which means that um, I can do other analytics on these messages. They are not only being used in this queue to be run, but I can do other stuff with this uh, very flexible system. SQS uh, is simple queuing service. It's Amazon's queuing service, also extremely easy to set up and extremely cheap. I think it's $14 cents for a million messages. So um, I'm not there yet. I hope I will at some moment start paying $40 cents for it. So that would be a good thing for me. Um, extremely easy to set up and extremely easy to hook in, into each other. Um, and very robust. I haven't had any outages whatsoever yet. Uh, so I'm pretty happy with that. Okay. Um, no super big magic here. This is a fairly common thing to do. You have long running background processes, you push them into the job queue. Um, and this is a misattributed quote because you should never bother your user facing API service with long running, dangerous, or stupid user requests. So far, so good. Now comes the interesting part. Um, and what's happening is we have a message waiting in our queue. It has some untrusted code. We don't really know what it does. We don't really care. Um, and very late into building this architecture, I actually found that I needed to split a couple of things even more. And this architecture that you see here, a launcher and a runner, is something that took a little while um, to come up with. Um, specifically during some simple pen testing I did, I started noticing, wait a minute, I need to do something here. The reason for this becomes pretty clear if I tell you what this launcher is doing. And here's the list of features it has. So a launcher is just a single node JS process. I run it uh, using PM2. You guys are maybe familiar with it. It's a process monitor and I launch at five or six per box. And what does the launcher do? Well, uh, the launcher listens to SQS, the queue, and unwraps the messages with the untrusted code that's in there as a string. Um, this untrusted code is then saved to disk in a JavaScript file. It then launches a Docker container uh, with the library called Docker Road. It's basically the most well-known uh, Node.js Docker uh, client. And it launches this container and it mounts the JavaScript file into the container as a disk. Then it actually starts reading the output, the standard out of the Docker container, and it basically reads what this puppeteer scrub is doing inside the Docker container. Um, it also monitors the state of the container. Is it up? Is it running? Is it in a fault state? Do I need to clean it up? Do I need to kill it? Etc. And it also uploads images because one of the nice features of Puppeteer and most of these headless browser technologies is that you can take screenshots. And specifically with monitoring, it's pretty nice to have a screenshot that, you know, your script doesn't work. Uh, you click on something, it's not the expected outcome. It's nice to have a, a visual image of that. Um, Puppeteer does that and the launcher scrapes these images from the disk and up uploads them to S3, which is Amazon's uh, file sharing or file storage service. Um, so that's, and we're not at the end, actually. Once this run is done, the launcher also sends a final message and stores the result in the database. And then it cleans up files. Um, this is very important because this puppeteer library allows you to download whatever you want. Uh, so there could be, I don't know what in this container running there. You could, could be malicious scripts, binaries, I don't know. So we wipe everything clean after the run is finished. So to do all that work, the launcher needs a ton of access. It needs credentials to all of these AWS services. It needs access to the disk. It needs access to the database, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So again, if I would just, I don't know, scrape the environment uh, variables, I would have a ton of information. So again, we cannot start running the untrusted code in the launcher because you have access to everything there. And that's where the runner comes in. So um, this split also, of course, increases stability. This is a very interesting thing when I DDoS myself. Um, the moment that you have a lot of messages, a lot of these runners are going to be spun up. 
they're going to do a lot of stuff. Um, you also want to be able to kind of rate limit the amount of these runners that are running because each extra run consumes CPU and mostly memory. You guys are probably pretty familiar with how much uh, resources a typical Chrome browser uses. Well, Puppeteer under the hood starts up a Chrome browser, technically a Chromium browser, but it's just as hungry for resources as a standard Chrome browser. So what would happen if I were to, you know, start auto-scaling this stuff, expand the amount of service uh, uh, with the amount of requests that are coming in? Um, I could easily, you know, uh, bankrupt myself uh, by just spinning up way too many boxes because all the requests are just flowing in and they're just being run without any control over if they should be run, if there should be a limit on the amount of runs per minute or per, you know, per hour. So there's a gatekeeper function also for this launcher that is strictly speaking for security, but also for financial reasons. Okay, let's jump into the other part, which is the runner. Um, the runner is actually running in a Docker container, already mentioned. So why is this necessary? Well, Docker is really good at separating processes and separating context. And um, the thing you get for free, for instance, is that the node process inside this uh, Docker container does not have access to the parent host. So whatever's going on there is separated from this, which is nice. It gives you a lot of freedom with these files and environment variables. Also, it gives you job isolation. Uh, remember, we're running a multi-tenant SaaS product, so there's going to be jobs from all kinds of different people running on exactly the same box side by side. I'm not sure what users are using this for, but they could easily use Checkly to log in to whatever system they have. You can uh, store a password and log in to some system, check if everything is good, and then log out again, or whatever, take a, a screenshot. And this means that credentials are in flight. They're somewhere there on that box. This isolation uh, that Docker gives you is a, gives you a lot of peace of mind. And then again, from a cleanup perspective, it's trivial to destroy the Docker container. So if someone were to download all kinds of crap into this co container, it is basically over and finished um, and completely erased at the moment that the container ends. You get that basically for free. But there's one big, 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 big but. Um, all things that are unhackable are, of course, always hacked. Uh, there's probably a tons of different ways that this is still vulnerable. And one of the big things, of course, is that Docker provides some kind of jail, but the inmates in this jail still have all the tools that the standard library of Node.js gives you. Um, they can poke around for holes, et cetera, and try stuff out endlessly, endlessly. So um, this toolbox that Node.js gives you, wouldn't it be nice if we could shrink that toolbox down to only the things that I say they are allowed to use? Exactly, that's a very good idea. That's where VM2 comes in. I have never heard of it until I uh, embarked on this journey. Um, and I have also never heard of Node VM, which, it is, which this is based on. Um, Node VM is part of the Node.js standard library, and it is described as a sandboxing tool, but it's not really sandboxing anything. The only thing it does is it provides a clean context for your code to run in. And you can look it up in the Node.js docs. Um, they say themselves, uh, the VM module is not a security mechanism. Do not use it to run untrusted code. Um, I know at first hand a couple of people, even at Google, that were that were didn't read this correctly and thought they were sandboxing their stuff, um, but it turned out they weren't. Um, I'm not really sure what the use of this module is. So um, luckily, we have GitHub and open source, and what happens is uh, a guy made VM2. And VM2 does exactly what we want from a sandboxing perspective. Um, I could start reading this stuff, but that's a bit boring. 
Um, but the first line is actually gives you a nice uh, uh, sum up of what it does. It allows you to whitelist modules, uh, external modules and internal modules, and provide this in a runtime context in which you then execute code. Uh, sounds very abstract, and I can actually just show you what it looks like. Oh, this is clear. Um, what we're doing here is um, we're re requiring VM2, we're calling it node VM. Uh, what happens then is that we call the create VM function, which is just a helper function. What we do in create VM is create an instance of node VM, and we give it a couple of options. And the most interesting, interesting options are at the bottom. The require key tells node VM which modules are allowed, which modules are not allowed. So in my require external key, I'm saying, okay, allow a puppeteer, uh, allow a puppeteer uh, helper um, package, um, and a couple of other things that I need to have to run this puppeteer code. Then the, the built-in key tells me that the only things that are allowed are file system and path. That's it. So you will, you'll notice there's no process here. So there's no process.exit, exit, no process.env that you can inspect inside the code. What I'm not showing here, but which is very interesting also, is that you can also mock objects. So let's say you have console log, but you want to do something with what's ever written to console log. You can provide mocks for this object and its methods and then the executing code will not know the difference. This is pretty powerful um, because you can use it to kind of um, reroute um, commands to other commands. Um, I use it specifically in the console log explanation that I just gave because I need to get output. I want to show people what they logged. So what I did is I actually mocked console log just write whatever is written to it as a string in an array. And then the end pops out at the run script uh, call you see right there. Because create VM returns a VM, um, we have a string of untrusted code. This one's a bit short, probably they're pretty long. Um, and then you call run on it. And this run then gives back another function, and that's the run script function, which actually produces an output. Um, a little bit of roundabouts here. Um, the implementation of this library is pretty amazing. It uses all kinds of proxies. I'm really uh, pretty in awe by how it works, um, but it works. So, um, what we learned here today is that I've gone through all this stuff to always protect the server code even at the expense of the user's code. This is, I guess, the general rule. Um, it doesn't make sense for me or anyone to allow people to do a lot of stuff if they're gonna break, in the end, the system, whether that's by malintent, they're malicious, they're hackers, they wanna to get to my billion dollar rockstar code, or because, you know, someone just broke buggy code or uh, uh, copy pasted something wrong. Um, both scenarios I should always avoid. Um, and the thing that I kind of learned was that building these types of systems where there's security and performance are kind of always together and they always need to keep working is building, it's a bit like building a medieval castle. Um, it doesn't really work to only build, you know, or dig a big moat around the castle. It doesn't really work to only build a big gate that keeps the bad guys out. It also doesn't work to just build a huge tower with a lot of weapons on it to, you know, uh, uh, scare off all the, all the bad guys. You need all of them. You need all of them because, you know, you might screw up in one or you might screw up in the other. And then it's like a layered system. It's like an onion where the one layer that screws up is then can depend on the other layers to provide this extra bit of security. And in the end, it's basically an arms race. So you put up enough barriers that people that want to do harm are like, ah, yeah, this is too hard. I could probably create
crack it or screw around with it, but I'll just go for the other guy. It's like with bike locks. If you have a bigger lock or two locks, they'll go for the bike lock or the bike with the small lock. So that's actually the end of the talk already. And what's interesting is that today, a different, a smaller version of this talk was actually pub published on uh, the free code camp on Medium. So if this went way too quick, and or you have questions or you want more code examples, that's all there. Um, I made a little bit.ly link for it, because the, the Medium link is huge. Um, so you can check that out and read it at your own pace. And that's it. You can follow me um, on Twitter. Um, if you have any questions, mail me at this address. And if this is something for you, you want to try it out, um, you can sign up for beta right now. I'm probably opening up the beta this week or next week. So we're very, very, very close to launch. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions now. There, behind the pillar. Uh, good question. So something very similar, but you all focus on security is 10 times the last experience because at the end of the day, I don't like trusted code. But uh, my approach was to run Puppeteer inside of a Lambda. Yeah. Did you consider that? Yes, very much. Um, and there's, um, it was the first thing I looked at. So for you guys, the question was, uh, why don't you run Puppeteer in AWS Lambda? Lambda is AWS a serverless technology and it gives you a ton of these things for free. Um, as in a runtime environment that's destroyed at the end, uh, you don't even have to inject credentials in the environment variables, because you can do that with something called roles, which is nice. So you can give the Lambda access to your database and queuing systems and whatever without you know, uh, making the API keys explicit. And the big reason why I'm not doing it is because AWS Lambda does not support node 8 or 7. Uh, so there's no async await. Um, the Puppeteer library is heavily depends on async await, but as many of you will know, you can still use promises. Um, let me just show you the code that we had here earlier. Um, this one. And uh, where is it? Okay, back to editor. Let's blow this up a bit. This is already quite a bit of code uh, because, you know, it actually is a mocha test. Um, I left that out of the talk because it's not the most interesting thing. It uses mocha and asserts, which are the standard asserts that come with the Node.js library, and it uses lots of async, await, 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 etc. If this were to be all with promises, which would run in Node 6, it would be twice the amount of code, and all the examples that are out there for Puppeteer would basically not work. So that's the reason. So the moment they introduced Node 8, I'm the first one. Yes? Sorry? Babel. Um, first of all, I don't use Babel. I thought about it because I want to be able to give users a very clear error message when something goes wrong with the exact names and the variables and the line numbers, et cetera, et cetera. So I want to keep the code that the user puts in, which is in this case, this, basically exactly as they put it in and run it somewhere in the back end. Um, because it makes debugging super easy, it makes getting started super easy. Um, that's mostly the reason. How long does it take between you post your and take the, the, the result. Yeah. So the question was, how long does it take between the post of the query and the result coming back? Um, you can actually see that right here. Let's press this thing again. Queuing, running. So if you see the flip from queuing to running, what's happening is that there's a, this is a um, web sockets connection that's set up and pushed into this client. And I stream the results from this check run. The moment it flips from, let's do it again. The moment it flips from queuing to running, that's when the Docker container starts. Running is the start of the Docker container. So that's pretty quick. There is a little bit of lag, uh, but mostly in my use case, it doesn't really matter. 
because these checks most of the time will run every minute, every five minutes. So this, you know, one second that you lose, it's like, you know, whatever. Um, however, the results that can vary heavily because it really depends on how big the website is that's being loaded. I, did, I think this one, Alibaba, let me switch. I had one where I did a demo of scraping the Walmart site and I was buying a Nintendo game or something like that. And the Walmart site is just a really heavy website, so it takes a lot of loading time. And that's pretty annoying, but yeah, strictly speaking, it has nothing to do with what I'm doing. It's up to the website owner to make the sites uh, less heavy to load. Uh, but again, it's pretty quick, so about a second or less. What from there? Sure. So going off of that, uh, what happens so if it runs on a Chrome every minute? What happens if the browser is longer than one minute? Yes, very good question. What happens if the Chrome uh, or the job is longer than one minute and you run it every minute? You would get like a cascading amount of jobs and all the results would get uh, scrambled and uh, so I, I kill them after one minute. <laughs> <laughs> That's the answer. Um, if there's a better solution later, I will probably try it out. Um, I can show you my Excel sheet, not right now because it's boring, but I can show you in my Excel sheet of how I calculated the cost of doing all of this. It's pretty elaborate. Also, AWS Lambda is really expensive when it comes to this stuff. Uh, although starting out is super cheap. Once you do it more, it gets really expensive. Um, so yeah, they're killed. And at this moment, um, what I'm going to launch with is that these browser checks can run uh, for one minute each five minutes. So there's always a four minute gap. The reason for this being, I literally don't see a good use case for running this every minute. With the API checks, it might be different. Um, they could definitely run each minute. Business question. Uh, when did, when are you going to start charging for this service? Um, soon, actually, yeah. Um, the beta is definitely free. So if you're on the list, you can try it out for, I don't know, a month or so. Uh, and then I'm going to start charging because I don't, I'm, let's say my former project or startup also did a lot of open source. The basic core packages of this, of this were, uh, are still open source. And that's an interesting business, um, and I don't want to do it again. So yeah, I'm going to just ask for it. Pricing is pretty much set, although not 100%. I try to make it cheap, but not without value. That's kind of a hard balance of civil thing. Swipe. Yeah, on this one, um, would it be possible to try a script that would run the script on this? Page. Absolutely, totally no problem. Do infinitely, I mean. Yes, okay. that could that, that could totally work. Um, what what is going to happen, of course, at a certain moment, is that I'm going to dog food this. I'm going to start checking my own application with my application. It kind of makes sense. Uh, there's some small some things with OAuth login. Um, I can, this is the test version uh, that are a bit tricky to do with expiring keys. It's kind of but with email addresses. And password that's pretty easy to do. You could log in and check that you could start checking, checking, and the API also. No questions? Um, yeah. uh, I have two questions. One yes. is uh, why don't you, and one is more from a like, developer user perspective. Sure. So the first one is is it correct that you're spinning up the software within the DC2 instance? Yes. Why are you not directly using ECS and just like pushing to the uh, Docker repository and spinning up, letting AWS take care of spinning up Docker? Have you ever worked with ECS? Yes. Me too. I hate it. I, I <laughs> really, really, really hate it. I, I mean, just, maybe, maybe we didn't have as many deploys, and when, 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 you, when you don't have the time <laughs> to be healthy, you don't care as much because I, I honestly never checked how it's, 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 it's for me, um, ECS, I tried working with it. It's, it's horrible. If I had more um, experience with Kubernetes, that might be an option, but but there's one big but, and that will give you all that you know on this, this slide I made at the end. Cheapest I can find. <laughs> <laughs> this running of this is not that special. I just need CPU and memory. I don't really care about who gives me that. I care about the location. 
that's super important for me because you know there's a configure thing that I can show you um, that you know um, people can run these things all over the world. So as long as I can find a data center that matches uh, here, this is another dashboard, by the way. Um, if I can find a provider that matches these locations and they're cheap, I'm going there. That's basically it. So waiting for Kubernetes on AWS. If it's cheap. <laughs> um, so I also have my other question. Sure. So the other question is, um, I know that we're running our, our we call it end-to-end -end tests, on applications that are like IP whitelisted. Mm -hmm. So um, you would run on a random IP here. How, yeah. how do you think um, that could tie in with people who would have to restrict access to like their test versions before production? That's where the enterprise option comes in. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I know exactly what you mean. I had this issue. With, uh, there's, there's many issues with what I'm doing here. Uh, I, um, just an anecdote, we used to do this when I was doing e-commerce and blah, blah, and operation stuff. We used to build this already. Um, we had Nagios, maybe familiar with people doing ops, like a fairly old school mo uh, monitoring system. And we would build JMeter scripts. JMeter is basically a load test tool, but it allowed you really early on already to make kind of these click paths. And we create these scripts and we would hook them into Nagios, it would be difficult and horrible, but we would have a dashboard that said, go to this side every X minutes, click on these things, do that and that, and check if it's, if it's still working. Many of our clients, as this was as an, at an uh, agency, were very happy with that, because they said, yeah, CPU metrics, I don't know what that means. I want to know what my shopping cart works. So we had exactly this problem, because we would have to allow these basic bots, because they are bots, to access this site and not trigger all kinds of other stuff. We had these um, recaptures. Those are pretty nasty. We couldn't, so we couldn't, you know, do these checks on sites that have recaptures on them because you know we're bots, so we don't know how to solve that. Um, so there are all kinds of issues here, which means that this is not finished yet. I need to work on this uh, over the years. But this specific IP that you get a, a set range of IPs would typically be something that would be in a higher price. Um, plans because it's basically just more expensive to run. Yeah. Did that answer your question? Yeah, it basically means we can start using it now, oh. but it, like you have thought about it just now. Yeah. <laughs> more questions behind the, Maybe the last question. Yeah, okay. Uh, you mentioned using SQS for queuing. Yeah. Are you doing the like um, scaling of your worker nodes? Uh, at this moment, I'm not. <laughs> so um, this is very much um, a nice to have for later. Um, what I'm doing is I'm actually watching the SQS queue and see uh, if there's any messages stuck. Um, the scaling is done by hand. So what, what happens, I start up a box, in this case, Vulture, whatever, it says four gigabytes. And I start five uh, workers which means there can be in a maximum of five of these checks running. If that is, you know, within the load average that I like, below one, then I'm happy. But when I see in my AWS metrics that queues, the queue is getting full and it's not at zero because that's the best, so the message is waiting to be used, I spin up another box. So uh, my complete wet dream would be that this would be automatic that based on the amount of messages that are in the queue, combined with some, I don't know, some load average somewhere, I'm not really sure how to do that, because auto-scaling is, is really, really, really hard to do right. Um, but that based on the amount of messages, the amount of flow of these messages, it would scale out, but also scale down, that's even harder. Um, but I'm pretty lucky that the amount of traffic that's happening, I can kind of control because they allow people to only run something once per minute, once per five minutes. So I'm kind of, I kind of know if one customer comes in and can do 15 checks, I can calculate what they're going to be um, if he, he or she uses the full amount of slots available in that plan. But for now, it's manual. All right. Uh, thanks a lot, and uh, have fun with the next. One.